enjoy that gift of eternal life. And we will see it in a way that we never imagined. Us with you and you with us in that place that you created. So Father, this morning as we prepare our hearts for our existence on this earth, Father, today as we look to the truth of Your Word to see how we might serve You better in the here and now, Father, remind us not to take our eyes off of the prize, and that prize is eternity with You, our final destiny and our final dwelling place. Father, for each church in our community this morning as they preach the Gospel, remind us that we are with them and they are with us. Father, for every church that um, preaches Jesus Christ crucified, Father, would you raise up those people that are under that teaching. And Father, may we stand together with them in arm, arm in arm, to proclaim this kingdom that's not ours, but is completely and fully yours. We give you thanks for that this morning. All God's people said, Amen. Amen, amen. Good morning to you all. Good morning to you all. All right, that's more like it. You know, I, I, the last few services I have recanted everything Pastor Floyd said about the triathlon. But I'll just say one thing. He's riding a bike. I mean, Keith, you can ride a bike, right? He's riding a bike. Our kids ride bikes, so that's a big deal that he's riding a bike? All right, we'll leave it at that, so... Anyway, welcome back. Hey guys, nice to see you. Beautiful. You're back in town now? For good? Beautiful. Well, welcome back. Man, I said talking to my friends while I'm up here. What a deal. So, we are in a new series. It's called The Game of Thrones. How many of you have watched the TV show? Man, that's daunting if you raise your hand in church, really. Watch the Game of Thrones. <laughs> I'd never seen it. I just think it's a cool name, Game of Thrones. And so when I was looking at our new series about the first king of Israel, Saul, and the second king of Israel, perhaps, no, Israel's greatest king, David, and then Solomon, David's son, I just thought, man, Game of Thrones, every, that sounds trendy and hip, and you know, you can tweet Game of Thrones from community church. I didn't know what that means, but anyway, we're going to be talking about the monarchy in Israel. So up until this point in time, 1 Samuel, Israel has no central government. Israel is this loose confederation of tribes and clans, and they live throughout the whole land of Canaan, throughout the land of Israel. And the way that God led this mass of people was through speaking to prophets. He would speak to a prophet through a dream, a vision, through an audible voice, and then that prophet would convey the message of God to the people, and then they in turn were expected to be obedient to what God had called them to do. And so this is called a theocracy, being led by God. God is the king, God is the ruler, and when you are led by God, this is called a theocracy, and that's what the nation of Israel lived under. You and I, as his sons and daughters, are called to live in a theocracy. God speaks to us through the power of His Spirit living in us. God speaks to us through the truth of His Word, and we are therefore obligated to follow what He's called us to do. You and I as Christians are to live under a theocracy. Democracy is a wonderful thing, but that's a political realm. Theocracy is a spiritual realm. So Israel was expected to live under a theocracy. God the Holy Father as ruler, they as obedient subjects, being led by the will of God as he speaks through the prophets. There's only one thing wrong with a setup such as this, is that eventually God's people and God's prophets were led astray by the cultures in which they lived, those surrounding cultures around Israel. Israel just weren't the only people occupying the land here. There was others who worshipped false gods and worshipped idols. So over time, the problem was is that the religious leaders, the prophets, and those that were called of God began to compromise the worship of God, and therefore the faith of the people was led astray. They were no longer a theocracy. They were each following um, 
their own self-interest. So in the midst of all of this, the people of Israel made a huge decision based on what the other cultures had. The other cultures had kings. The other cultures had queens. The other cultures had this whole different political setup than the nation of Israel. So they became convinced that an earthly king could solve their problems. That's wonderful in theory, but it's not very good in reality. So, church, let me remind you of this. No earthly king can solve our problems. No earthly ruler, dictator, president, prime minister, no earthly ruler is going to solve our problems because our problems are problems of the heart. They are not problems within a political realm. And once we address the core of our spiritual problems, we will then live out better lives between each other. The problem isn't black lives matter. The problem isn't all lives matter. The problem is people's hearts are full of sin and pursue self-pleasure rather than the things of God. Isn't that the problem? That's why there's racism. That's why we mistreat each other. That's why we pursue divorce. That's why we mistreat our kids. That's why there's poverty. That's why there's sex trafficking. That's why there's human enslavement. That's why there's single welfare moms, single welfare dads, because our hearts have pursued everything except the God of heaven. So, Israel convinced we need a king so we can be like all these other nations. They have a king, but we are called to be unique and peculiar. We are aliens on this earth, right? We had to be reminded of that, that we are just passing through. Look at your neighbor and say, we're just passing through. Look at, we're just, we're de- so don't get stuck here. Don't put down roots here because we're leaving. So, often the history of a great nation begins with the rise and fall, right? The rise and fall of the Roman Empire. That's how histories begin. And this is certainly true of Israel. The rise and fall of Israel. Israel rose to great heights under King David, but it was only a few short years later that they were found within a civil war that divided the nation of Israel. And Israel never became sovereign again from the time of 1 Kings chapter 12 until 1948. That's a long time to have no identity. That's a long time to have no no, uh, nation to call your own. For all of those centuries... They were either ruled or occupied or dominated by other people. God is serious when he says, I want you to follow me. God is serious when he calls us to a life of commitment. And these were his chosen people. So he had high hopes and great expectations for them, just as he has high hopes and great expectations for you and I. So there's four major players that we're going to look at. The first is King Saul. He was all show and no go. He looked kingly. He spoke like a king. He had the presence of a king, but he had no substance. Then there was King David, Israel's greatest king. Israel's, the pinnacle of the nation of Israel, came to be under the reign of David. But yet we know David had his flaws. Ultimately, the kingship was passed down to David and Bathsheba's son Solomon, and we certainly know about his wisdom. But he lacked common sense. So we'll look at those three. I said there was four people. The fourth person that's a part of this is the prophet Samuel. Israel's last prophet Samuel. He was connected to King Saul. He was connected to King David and ultimately connected to Solomon in time. So this man plays a role in the monarchy of Israel. 
And that's where we're going to start this morning, looking at this history. Very different than the book of Romans, where we learned about theology, what to believe, how to behave. Very different than the teachings of Paul in the New Testament. This is the history of ancient Israel. We're going to look at what they believed, what they chose to do because of their belief, and what the results were because they chose to do those certain things. And hopefully, we will draw some things out of their history that we can make application to to our lives. So if you need a Bible, raise your hand. Anybody need a Bible? I want you to follow along. Raise your hands nice and high. If you got a Bible, go ahead and turn to 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 1. 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 1. I'm going to begin with Samuel's birth, which was unique in and of itself. He's got this amazing birth story. So let's look at Samuel's birth. There was a man named Elkanah, and he had two wives. First of all, the story starts in a bad place. God never called us to have two wives. God never called you to have two husbands. If you remember and you go back to the garden, I'm pretty sure it was one man, one woman for life. You agree? Pretty much, yeah. So when we read that this story starts with a man that had two wives, he's already up to his eyeballs and you know. So there's a man named Elkanah. He had two wives, Hanina, Hannah and Penina. Why did he have two wives? Well, culturally, that was acceptable, not necessarily with God, but culturally that was acceptable because if you married a woman and she bore you no children, then you were able to marry another woman who would bear you children. Because children were a mark of God's blessing. Wait, let me take that back. Sons were a mark of God's blessing. So if my first wife who Hannah was Elkanah's true love. If my wife gave me no children, then therefore I was obligated to go find another wife who would give me children. So there was a man named Elkanah. He had two wives, Hannah and Penina. Penina had children, but Hannah did not. Each year Elkanah would travel to Shiloh to worship and sacrifice to the Lord. Shiloh is where the Jews went to make sacrifices to God. That's where the high priest was. That's where the tabernacle was. So this family, a husband, two wives, and the one wife's children, they would go each year to Shiloh to worship and make sacrifices to the Lord. Verse 6. So Penina wasn't very nice. She would taunt Hannah and make fun of her because the Lord had kept her from having children. Some of you may know exactly what this feels like. Some of you may sympathize with Hannah because of the grief that she had to put up with at the hands of another because she was barren and had, not, and had no children. Verse 7, each year it was the same thing. Penina would taunt Hannah as they went to the tabernacle. Each time Hannah would be reduced to tears and she would not even eat. She couldn't enjoy going to the tabernacle to worship God because she was being taunted and treated poorly by her sister wife. Verse 9. Whoop, verse 9. Once, after a sacrificial meal at Shiloh, Hannah got up and went to pray. Eli the priest was sitting in his customary place beside the entrance of the temple. And Hannah was deep in anguish. She was crying bitterly as she prayed to the Lord. And she made this vow. O Lord of hosts, God of heaven, if you will look upon my sorrow, if you will look upon my barrenness and answer my prayer and give me a son, notice she said, give me a son, then I will give him back to you and he will be yours for his entire lifetime. That's a crazy prayer. God, let me win the lottery and I won't keep any of the money. What's the point of praying that prayer? I mean, I'm just, you know, this is just me. I'm just thinking through this. God, let me win the lotto, but I won't keep any of the money. God, I'm childless, so give me a child, and then I in turn will turn him over to the service of your kingdom for the rest of his life. Give me a child so I can be childless. It doesn't make any sense. But as we look at this woman, Hannah, who had this unique relationship with God, who I might say makes mine look poor, she had this unique connection and relationship with God that she prayed and believed in God's move 
movement in such a way that, God, if you answer the prayer because of who you are and what you've done for me, I in turn will give this child over to your service for the rest of his life. Wow. So Hannah is in the tabernacle. Eli is sitting at the door, and she is praying. She's moving her lips, but she's not speaking. You know, sometimes you ever do that? You pray, but you're praying in your head. You're praying in your heart. You're moving your lips, but, but no voice, no, no sounds coming out. So Eli looks over at her, and he makes an assumption. Well, she's drunk. Huh. She's drunk. And so he scolds her for being drunk in God's house. But then she explains the whole situation to Eli. He acts as a counselor. He acts as an advisor. So she says, Eli, here's my plight. Here's my story, Eli. And so Eli, being very sympathetic with her, says this in verse 17. In that case, and you know, I've heard all your situation, in that case, go in peace. May the God of Israel grant the request you have asked of him. Oh, thank you, sir, she exclaimed. Then she went back and began to eat again. And she was no longer sad. So all of a sudden, through this prayer in the tabernacle, in the blessing of Eli, her whole countenance changed. And she went back to her family, and she began to enjoy her time in Shiloh. And then as we read the rest of the story, a year later, Samuel was born. A year later, Samuel has been born. And she couldn't go worship in Shiloh because she was breastfeeding the baby. And so, the story goes on to say that after Samuel had been weaned, and I don't know when you wean children. I don't know what weaned means. I guess it's when you stop breastfeeding. When the baby stopped breastfeeding, somewhere between birth and seven, I don't know. I, I, you know, I don't know how you moms do stuff now. It's different than when we were having children. Anyway, that's not the point. The point is, once the child was weaned, she then, with Elkanah and Penina and the rest of the children, they went to Shiloh, and she brought Samuel, this young child, somewhere between a toddler and a five-year-old, I don't know, she brought this child to the tabernacle. And she left the child with Eli the priest. God blessed her with the child. He answered her prayer. And Hannah, being faithful to her promise, Hannah, being faithful to her commitment, took the child and dropped him off at the tabernacle. If any of you are praying this prayer and are going to leave your kids with me at the tabernacle, don't pray. I, I, we're, we're good here. You know, I, we got Steve and Pastor Floyd. We got Stephanie in the office. Don't bring us your children and leave them with us. Right, Steve? We're good. But you can't bring your kids to Sunday school and Awana and Children's Church. Bring your kids to that. But, but don't bring them to me. Verse 27. I asked the Lord to give me this boy, and God has granted my request. And now I'm giving him to the Lord and he will belong to the Lord his whole life. What an amazing woman. What an amazing encounter of faith. What an amazing woman to take what she had prayed so diligently and desperately for. And now she handed him back over to God. She was barren, and she had a child. Now she came to the tabernacle, and she left, and she was barren again. But yet the joy in her heart was overwhelming. So in chapter 2, verses 1 to 10, turn there and you'll see Hannah's song of praise to God. Oh God, thank you for giving me a child. God, thank you I can give him back to you. Wow, how do you pray that prayer? How do you sing that song? But she did. She praised God. She gave thanks to God for the joy of carrying that child for nine months, for, for knowing that her relationship with God was full and abundant because God heard her prayer. She was blessed by Eli. She gave birth to young Samuel. And now his life would be dedicated to the service of God. And her heart was full. And then 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 11, look there with me. Then Elkanah and Hannah returned home to Ramah without Samuel. How would you like to go on vacation, Mom, 
and not come home with one of your kids. Wow. But yet this was Hannah. This was a woman of faith. This was a woman who had this understanding of God's work in her life. Then they returned home to Ramah without Samuel, and the boy served the Lord by assisting Eli the priest. Assisting Eli the priest. Eli was the priest. He had two sons that were assisting him, but Samuel was to grow up in the tabernacle, learning the priesthood, being obedient to God, and having this unique place in the history of Israel, which was yet to come. So with that in mind, let's move on to 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 12. Let's talk about Eli and his family, which was a family gone wrong. This morning, understand, godly parenting does not always translate into godly children. Godly parenting doesn't always translate into godly children. Eli had two sons and they were worthless. His two sons were priests. His two sons were raised in the priesthood. His two sons were called to the priesthood by virtue of their birthright. And look what verse 12 of chapter 2 says. Now the sons of Eli were scoundrels who had no respect for the Lord or for their duties as priests. Ooh, how'd you like to be in that church? Oh, would you like to be in that church? where those doing the ministry were scoundrels and they had no respect for God or for their position within within the church? Unbelievable. But yet, sadly, sadly, there are churches across America where the leadership no more honors and acknowledges God than the man in the moon. But unfortunate, even more unfortunate than that are Christians, so-called Christians, who are scoundrels. They have no respect for the Lord. And they have no respect for their call as followers of Jesus Christ. Why is the church in distress? Because we are more like Eli's sons and we are less like Hannah. That's why the church has lost its power. That's why the church has lost its reputation. That's why the church exerts no more influence into our culture. Now the sons of Eli's were scoundrels, had no respect for the Lord or for their duties as priests. Verse 17. So the sin of these young men was very serious in the Lord's sight. Church, understand, God knows your comings and goings. God knows your thoughts. God knows your words and your actions. He knows every secret thing about you. And it's serious when it's sin. Sin is serious to God. Now, we live in a culture where, oh, well, it's okay to tell a white lie. Right? We live in that culture. Oh, it's okay. Well, at least I didn't murder somebody. We justify our sins. We compromise our sins. But yet to God, our sins are serious. Our choices matter to Him. Our lifestyle and behavior is important to the King of glory. We may be able to laugh off our poor behavior, but God doesn't laugh off our poor behavior. God doesn't give us a pass on our foolishness. So Eli had tried to correct his sons but it was too little too late. You see, when your son's 27, 28 years old, that's not the time to start trying to correct your son or daughter. So, verse 22. Now Eli was very old, but he was aware of what his sons were doing to the people of Israel. He knew, for instance, this is just one for instance. They were doing more stuff, but this is the only one we're privy to. For instance, he knew that his sons were seducing the young women who assisted at the entrance of the tabernacle. Again, how would you like to go to that church? How would you like to bring your teenage girls into that place where they were seduced by the men of God who were supposed to be serving the people who were supposed to be offering themselves up to the the ministry of God, the work of God, and be a 
positive influence in the life of the people. So as I said, Eli tried to chastise his son. He, he tried to correct his sons, but look at verse 25. But Eli's, sin, Eli's sons wouldn't listen to their father. For the Lord was already planning to put them to death. Scripture says, be sure that your sins will what? Find you out. The Lord was already planning to put Eli's sons to death. Be sure that your sins will find you out. Be stupid long enough and God may just take you out of the game. It's his prerogative. He's the sovereign holy God of heaven. He knows exactly what's wrong from what's right. He is a righteous and holy judge. In fact, Paul talks about that in 1 Corinthians 11 when he's talking about communion, about the Lord's table. He says, don't take this bread in this cup in an unworthy fashion. Don't come to the Lord's table drunk. Don't come to the Lord's table with a gluttonous attitude. Because some of you have come to God's table in an unworthy fashion, Paul says many of you are sick. Many of you are physically sick and spiritually sick. And many of you have died because you've taken your walk with God lightly. You know what it says, 1 Corinthians 11? Go back and read that. So Eli's sons wouldn't listen to their father, but the Lord was already planning to put them to death. So in the meantime, a man sent from God had come to Eli. And he didn't bring good news to Eli. This visitor from God that had come to Eli said, Eli, let me tell you what's up. Number one, God's had enough of you and your boys. Number two, God's going to kill both your sons on the same day. And number three, Eli, you are done being a priest. Your family is done being a priest. Your clan is done being a priest. I'm going to remove you from this priesthood. That's what the visitor came because the visitor had come from God and he explained all of this to Eli. It was a harsh rebuke. He prophesied shame and doom would come to the house of Eli. But he said, I will raise up a holy prophet or priest. I will raise up a righteous priest. And we see that later on in the book of 1 Kings when Zadok is risen up to take Eli's place. So that's a family gone wrong. But in spite of that, on the flip side of this, we see a family that had got it right. And that was the family of Elkanah and Hannah. Eli's family was a train wreck. But Elkanah and Hannah, they were doing quite well because they were committed to God. They were following the lead of God. And their lifestyle honored God. Look with me at 1 Samuel 2, verse 18. This is Hannah's son, Samuel. But Samuel, though he was only a boy, served God. Underline that, circle that, highlight that. Well, Pastor Rick, why do you do Awana? Why do you do children's Sunday school? Why do you do children's church? Why do you va do vacation Bible school? We do those things because though Samuel was only a boy, he served the Lord. Children can learn to serve the Lord at a very young age. We're going to baptize a few today. Why? Because they made a conscious decision that they no longer want to follow the world, but they want to give the rest of their life to following King Jesus. Now, anytime a child makes that decision, I think that's a pretty good deal. I think that's an amazing thing. Though Samuel was a boy, he served the Lord. Verse 18, he wore a linen garment like that of a priest. Each year his mother made a small coat for him and brought, him and brought to him when she came with her husband for the sacrifice. Verse 20, before they returned home, each time that they would come year after year to sacrifice at Shiloh and visit Samuel, before they returned home each year, Eli would bless Elkanah and his wife. And he would say, may the Lord give you other children to take the place of this one that she gave to the Lord. And the Lord gave Hannah three sons and two daughters. We have this crazy idea within the church, within our culture. How little do I have to give up to follow Jesus? 
You ever hear people say that? Well, I don't want to follow Jesus because then I got to stop drinking. I got to stop smoking. I got to stop fishing. I got to, we have this crazy understanding in our culture that if we're going to follow Jesus, we got to give up all the stuff that's fun, all the stuff that we love. We got to give it up and now just follow Jesus. I guarantee you, church, whatever you give up, there will be a day that you will look back at that and say to yourself, why did I even want that in the first place? Because God will restore so much more. What I gave up, man, I have got back a hundredfold from God in my family, in my walk with Him, in my spiritual life. You don't give up stuff for Jesus. What you do is you get blessed by Him and you forget all about the stuff that was so important back then. So, what did Hannah get? Because of this amazing prayer and relationship with God, God, if you give me a son, I'll give him back to you. Oh, she got three more sons and two daughters. That's what she got. Well, that's a pretty good deal. That's a pretty good return. Verse 21, And the Lord gave Hannah three sons and two daughters. Meanwhile, as they were growing this family back at home, meanwhile, in Shiloh at the tabernacle, Samuel grew up in the presence of the Lord. Verse 26 adds, The boy Samuel grew taller and grew in favor with the Lord and with people. Family gone bad, family gone right. There's a way for us to live. So let's look at Samuel's faithfulness. Chapter 3, verse 1. Chapter 3, verse 1. Now chapter 3, verse 1 tells us something about the spiritual condition of Israel. Look with me at verse 1. Chapter 3. Meanwhile, the boy Samuel served the Lord by assisting Eli. Now in those days, messages from the Lord were very rare, and visions were quite uncommon. Why were words from the Lord very rare? Why were visions uncommon? Because the people were too busy pursuing everything but God. He didn't even talk to them anymore. Could you imagine that a nation got to a place where God didn't even... Well... It's called America. Can you imagine when a nation gets in a place where God doesn't even speak to them anymore? Can you imagine a believer getting in a place in their life where God doesn't even speak to them anymore? Well, we've all been there. The nation of Israel was dry. They had turned their back on God, and God had nothing to say to them anymore. Verse 2. One night, Eli was almost blind by now, He had gone to bed. The lamp of God had not yet gone out. This is an encouraging prophetic word. Even in America, the lamp of God has not yet gone out. Even for our next door neighbor who acts as pagan as anybody could possibly be, the light has not gone out for those people in our world. The light's not gone out yet. So church, let's stop acting like the light has gone out because it hasn't. The lamp of God had not yet gone out and Samuel was sleeping in the tabernacle near the ark of God. So in the tabernacle, there was this lamp that was near the ark of the covenant. And Samuel's job was to keep that light going throughout the course of the night and it could not be extinguished until sunrise. So Samuel's job, one of his jobs, was to sleep by that, wake up throughout the night, make sure there was plenty of oil in the lamp so that it didn't go out before morning. And then in the morning as the sun rose, Samuel would extinguish that. So that was one of his jobs. So Samuel was sleeping there doing his job, and in the middle of the night, he heard, Samuel, Samuel, So Samuel jumped up and he ran into Eli and he said, Eli, what's going on? What do you need? Eli said, I didn't call you Samuel. Oh, okay. So Samuel went back and lay down in bed and went back to sleep. A little while later, Samuel, Samuel. Samuel jumped up and he ran into Eli. He said, Eli, what what, what do you need? Eli said, Samuel, I didn't call you. Samuel went back and laid down and went to sleep and A little while later, Samuel, Samuel, and up he bolted and he ran into Eli. He said, Eli, what is it? 
Even old, crusty, hardened, disobedient Eli figured this one out. Samuel, next time you hear that voice, you say, speak, God, your servant's listening. You see, in the midst of this, even old Samuel, even old Eli, figured out that God was calling this boy. God was speaking to this boy. And Samuel, in his wisdom, in his disobedience, said, Samuel, when you hear the voice, say, here I am, Lord, speak to me. And this is what I want us to understand today. For many of us, God has been telling us something for many years, for many months, for many weeks. We know He's calling, we know He's speaking, but yet we keep failing to respond. Church, this morning I want us to say, speak to me, Lord, your servant is listening. I don't know what you need to talk to God about. I don't know what He's been trying to tell you or what you need to hear from Him. But I do want to encourage you this morning that if God has been calling you and calling you and speaking to you and speaking to you and you have yet told Him, here I am, God. Let me know what it is you want me to do. I would just encourage you to do that this morning. So, on that fourth time, Eli says, third time Eli says, next time God calls, you raise up and you say, speak God, I'm listening. So on the fourth time Samuel was woken up, Samuel, Samuel, he lifted up his arms, he said, speak Lord for your servant is here and I'm listening to you God. You know what God told him? It wasn't good news. God told him, Samuel, your mentor Eli, I'm going to remove him from the priesthood. Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, I'm going to kill on the same day. So what Samuel got from God was a confirmation of what the visitor earlier had told Eli about his family, about his fortune, and about his birthright. They will be pushed to the side. So when he woke up the next morning, of course, Eli said, Samuel, what did God tell you? Uh, I don't know if you want to really hear what God told me. Eli said, no, Samuel, you tell me, what did God tell you? So reluctantly, Samuel told Eli the story, which he already knew about anyway. And then Eli says, it's the Lord's will, Samuel. Let him do what he thinks is best. And you know what I see in Eli's response? I see a man who has regretted his choices in life. Let's not be Eli's. Let's not look back at our foolishness and our disobedience at the end of our life with regret because Eli was full of regrets. It is the Lord's will. Let him do what he thinks best. I wish I would have made other decisions, but now it's in God's hands. So church, we have time to change our direction. We have time to change our ways before we look back with regret. Eli was out of time. Verse 19, Samuel continued on. 1 Samuel 3, 19. And as Samuel grew up in the tabernacle, the Lord was with him, and everything Samuel said proved to be reliable. Wouldn't it be great if he was running for president? Because everything he said is reliable. Verse 20, and all of Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, this is kind of a, a way that they said the four corners of the world, from the north and Dan all the way to the south in Beersheba, the people knew that Samuel was confirmed as a prophet of the Lord. And the Lord continued to appear at Shiloh and give messages to Samuel there at the tabernacle, chapter 4, verse 1, and Samuel's words went out to all the people of Israel. Samuel was part of a renaissance. Samuel was part of a restorative work within the nation of Israel. So if the worship team will come forward, get ready to close. So as a result of this history lesson, what do you think we might consider? Because like I say, this is different than the book of Romans. This is ancient Israeli history. What do we, what do we learn when we look at a history story? 
What do we learn when we look at a documentary? Well, Winston Churchill said, those who fail to learn from history are doomed to repeat it. Church, let's not be doomed to repeat history. Let's not repeat the foolishness of Eli. Let's not repeat the foolishness of his sons. Let's not repeat the foolishness of Israel who had turned their back on God. I want to use each person to remind us about something we might consider. Hannah said in her song of praise, the Lord is a God who knows what you've done and he will judge your actions. And Hannah obeyed God and followed him, and God judged her actions, and she was blessed. And Eli disobeyed God, and his sons disobeyed God, and they were not blessed. In fact, the priesthood was taken away from them, and Hophni and Phinehas died on the same day. God will judge you, church, for your actions. You don't get a pass as Americans. I don't get a pass as a pastor. They don't get a pass for being the worship team. We will be called into account by a God who is holy, righteous, and just, and he will call us on the carpet. Hophni and Phinehas, the two sons of Eli, who should have been serving God faithfully in the priesthood, they were scoundrels who had no respect for God or for their duties as priests. I hope you're not this kind of Christian who has no respect for God and walks carelessly throughout your life as a Christian. Then there's Eli. When the man came from God to visit Eli, he said this, Why do you scorn all of my blessings on your life, Eli? Why do you give your sons a pass and you shake your fist in my face? Because that's what Eli did. He barely slapped the wrists of his sons and ignored the call of God on his life. Eli should have been the ones to put his sons to death. And he should have done it with a smile because of the way they were living their lives, the disdain that they had for the call of God on their lives. Eli should have done what was right. You and I scorn the blessings of God by living improperly in spite of his blessings. Then there's Samuel. If Samuel grew up The Lord was with him and everything he said was reliable. As Samuel grew up, God blessed him, God nurtured him, God empowered him, and he made a difference in the nation of Israel. We're a church of 600 people. Shouldn't we be making a difference in the neighborhood called Susanville? And then lastly, there's the rebuke of God to Eli. Eli... I will honor those who honor me, Hannah and Elkanah, and I will despise those who think lightly of me. Eli, you and your two sons. I don't know what part of this history that you need to pay attention to, but my prayer is that you and I will be like Samuel. God, you speak because your servant is listening. What is God speaking to you about this morning? I'm going to ask Pastor Steve and Cheryl to come up here and I'll ask David and Annette, would you guys be over here? They'd love to pray with you. What's God telling you this morning? Let's sing with Randy.